Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold. As always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. How are we doing today, Jay? We are caffeinated. We are doing well. <laughs> we are caffeinated. We are wet up here in the Bay Area, which is not Sacramento. No. Well, it was <laughs> cold here in L.A. last night. It dipped below 70. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we got a guest with us. Today. Do you yes, we do. do. A little intro here. Yes, um, Kyle Vincent is joining us today. I I first kind of became aware of Kyle. I was working at Tower Records, and I saw this album cover for a band called Candy. It was probably back in the mid '80s, like '85 or '86, and the album was called Whatever Happened to Fun. And I just I'd never heard the music, but the album cover was like the head of the Statue of Liberty and these cool looking dudes with great looking hair, and it just looked badass. So. I immediately bought the album, fell in love with the album. Uh, I've been a fan ever since. You may remember Kyle. Uh, he was on the radio with a, a pretty big hit in 1997 called Wake Me Up, when the world's worth waking up for. Um, I got the opportunity to work with him when I was at Universal with my uh, digital label uh, there. Um, right now, um, Kyle tours his ass off all over the world, and he's releasing uh, an album called The Great Manilo Songbook. Ah, there it is. Just Shame, out. Shameless <laughs> plug. And it's, it's amazing. And if you haven't had a chance to make it to a Kyle Vincent performance, you got to go. You will have a great time. Anyway, uh, Kyle, welcome to our, uh, our little show. Hey, Jay. Hey, Michael. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Great. Jay. It's you know it's great, I, Jay. I, I, I'm I'm like Jay. I remember I remember this band called Candy and and you know, I mean I don't have to tell you this. Candy has always had this forever cult following. Right? I specialize in cult followings. <laughs> it's one of those yeah. things where I, I you know it, it, I I always encounter somebody who's like, man, you know, I wish Candy would get back together. I want another Candy album. You know, it's just like you don't hear that about every band, but it's like constantly I hear something. Somebody says Candy was great. They didn't get their shot. They didn't, you know, whatever. And and it's just it, it's it's cool yeah, that it's cool to right. have one of the guys from Candy here. <laughs> and all my friends that are music freaks like Michael and, you know, all the people, Kyle, that you and I know, you know, the Elliot Kendall's of the world and these people who are just music fanatics. They, they all know these songs and they're they're kind of woven into their uh their psyche and it's it was uh probably it's one of those things like jellyfish where it wasn't as popular probably during its day than after you know yeah um I, it's so nice to hear these things i wish i wish we had heard them when it when it was actually happening i mean we had, <laughs> we had our, where were you guys damn it um but i mean i'm I could and I am writing a book about just the the reality of the music business and timing um, and how, you know, I'd like to say through no fault of my own. I'm sure I've had some faults somewhere along the line because we all screw up. But um, it's pretty – I mean, I laugh at it now. I think I've had six or seven record deals, including one that you so graciously threw on my desk, Jay. Um, and it's just, you know – the candy A and R guy Jerry Jaffe, who was wonderful, wonderful guy, um, was let go. Um, I don't know three weeks before the isn't album. Isn't that out. isn't that oh, the story? I heard that story, yes. So many well, times I, that the A and R guy gets let go and a band just dies. Yeah, you know it happened at, at no Hollywood and Universal, but Hollywood Records at the time. I have nothing but great things to say about them. That was the Wake Me Up label, and they worked their tails off. And I and I'm still friends with a lot of them, and and so I really have nothing bad to say about that at all, except also the president who um, Bob Pfeiffer, I guess at the time, and there was some issues there, and he was also like, oh, and all of a sudden an attorney takes over, and oh, <laughs> he just like trashed, uh, everybody's yeah. gone, and, and I actually got on the phone and said, wait, wait, I'm the only guy who had a charting single at that entire label last year, um, so. Yeah. You, just kind of um what do you call it's in war um lick your um, wounds no a uh, uh, friendly not friendly fire what's it called i don't know i forgot but um yeah it's and we've heard this story before you know i mean it happened to john Waite. it's happened to a lot of our friends and it's 
it's brutal because then when when they change the regime you you're not that that's not your guy you know and they don't have any loyalty towards you they want to bring in their own people and sometimes it's just that simple and it's and it's a shame because there's a lot of great music that kind of you know goes to the wayside right i mean the other side of that is that i've been pretty fortunate to have even one record deal so to have a handful means at some point somebody in the industry said i'm going to invest yeah. money and my reputation in this guy and that's a hell of a burden you know, yeah. I, I swear to God, it, it even carries with live shows. If I play a show and there aren't a lot of people there, I don't feel so bad for me. I feel bad for the promoter because he's he or she has invested in me, and I feel this horrible, there's this huge responsibility to fill the joint and make everybody have a successful night. And that's kind of how I felt with record deals. Maybe not the first one because you're a young punk, but I, and you expect everything to be, you know, perfect. Yeah. But after yeah. That, I, you know, like with Hollywood, I'm just like, oh man, I owe it to these hardworking people that the the down to the secretaries, down to the assistants, to the assistants, the interns who are sure. just bleeding for you. you yeah, know? And you bring up a really good point, Kyle, and that is that you know, showmanships. You're an entertainer. For those who haven't seen you live, um, there are certain bands that you go see, and they their heads are down. You know, they play their music. And it's just like the record or or whatnot. When you go see a Kyle Vincent show, it's kind of a mix of, you know, glam rock, Las Vegas. It's just all those great things. It's it's a production. It's a show. And you you always leave there with a big smile on your face. You know, there's humor, there's there's music that we grew up with, there's your own music. And I think that's super important that you you put on a performance. It was a I think it was Bunny Carlos said one time, you know, th they played these shows for two people and, you know, it was like a boy and a girl fighting. And he said, you got to play your ass off because if one of them didn't like you, it cut your audience in half, you know, and it's, it, and I, you're the kind of guy that if you're playing for, you know, 60 people or 6,000 people, it's, it's a production. Talk a little bit about that. It's true. I'm, I'm, that's, Boy, I couldn't have put it better. I really appreciate that. A few years ago, I stopped saying I'm a singer-songwriter because that does just make you have an image of a guy in a corner at a cafe, brooding, head down. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Hard, and you're, that's, a tough, that's the toughest gig in the world, and I still do that, and, and I have respect for people who do that. Sure. But I changed to more of an entertainer. And, I mean, I've always kind of had that kind of vagacy, <laughs> maybe to my detriment at times, um, Vegasy showmanship thing, um, but now I've really I just feel like I'm kind of in my prime balance of showmanship and and brooding <laughs> songwriter guy <laughs> kind of do both because you know people the world sucks this has been one of the worst years ever in the history of the planet sure has and I don't want to leave people miserable now I'll make a miserable about relationship songs but then I'll try to you know sing sky high you know then sure I really don't be a hero. And really bring them up and realize, you know, this is the end of the day. This is a three minute pop song, man. This isn't, you know, I am yeah. not really trying to change the world. If it changes You're playing songs that great. nobody really plays anymore. I mean, yeah. you just mentioned Billy Don't Be a Hero, but a lot of the songs, I shouldn't say a lot of the songs, there, there, are, there are several songs in your set that aren't covered by very many people. And when you hear it, you know how music is. It just brings you back, and those songs are just so magical. Talk a little bit about some of the songs that you sprinkle in your set, because they're they're pretty amazing. Well, I, I was born um, with a weird melodic gene, <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It could be Lobo. It could be, you know, we had joy, we had fun. If there's Me and you and a dog named Boo. That, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, I just love those songs. I mean, I love soul. I love all sorts of things, classical music, all sorts of music. But I have a real um, soft spot for your three minute, usually one hit wonder pop songs, yeah. mostly yeah. from the 70s. The 70s and guilty pleasures. Really, Absolutely. And, 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 and Michael, but I don't feel guilt. No, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I love thinking. those songs. I love those songs. <laughs> I don't feel guilt. I don't. And it's just. You know, we'll, we'll probably get into this Manilow sure. thing, but I have to bring it up not to tie into this necessarily, but because it, it's so much a part of this. When I was growing up in Berkeley, where I am now, um, I mean, it was, I was, couldn't have been more uncool because of my musical tastes, you know? And here's this guy 
he kind of looks like a cool guy. He's kind of got a little swagger and a little long hair, and he plays jazz and plays the saxophone. But then he loves Barry Manilow and he loves the Carpenters. You know, what's wrong with this guy? Right. And to this well, day, everybody I, did it, Kyle, but nobody admitted it. Right. And you, I was you the admitted idiot. it. I was the dummy who admitted it and took it one step further and actually sing these songs in concert. Even Candy, even Candy. Sometimes we would start the show and I would do like 20 seconds of a Carpenter song or a Sinatra song. <laughs> and then we'd go into like Weekend Boy or something. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, a, a totally a cappella. Just go out there and wow. go, my funny Valentine. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. And the audience would be like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I can't change, man. I just love melody, and that's the common thread that goes through all these things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, Kyle, Kyle it, you, it was mentioned um, when we first started talking here, timing. You know, the, the timing is such an important element in a musical career, whether it's album releases, tours, you name it. Timing is so important. And through your your wisdom and your experience, talk to us a little bit more about timing. How have you how have you dealt with it? I mean, is it something that you try to be consciously aware of that you 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 can't be aware of it? I mean, it, it because I think more than anything, we see timing impact careers in a negative way more than a positive way. I think that's true because we all know, all three of us know, the odds of massive success in this industry are, are almost nil. It's, it's almost like winning the lottery. It's very, very small. You could get a record deal. But then all everything has to fall into place for not just the material. But we assume you have the material because you just got signed. But then everything has to fall into place from the everybody That's at right. the label, your A and R, the assistant, and really the most important, the people kind of down below that who have to be in the streets working for you. Then your local promo people. Then radio, and you got to get enough money to find a way to get the promotion going. Independent promotion people, all those things. That hasn't really changed. So that is kind of out of the artist's hand. If you're a nice guy and you do everything they tell you to do pretty much while hopefully retaining some of your integrity, you know, don't complain too much about the 8 by 10 that you hate. I learned that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. I mean, just yes, yes, yes. And But I'll tell you, like my first my first solo deal was with, was with MCA. And... Uh, and I was on tour with Manila. I was his opening act for the whole summer tour. Huge, 25,000 people a night, right? Um, the album was never released. They spent 400 k on it. They spent 100000 on the on the video. Uh, I mean, they dumped so much money into this thing. It was a fabulous album. And finally, I show up in Al Teller's office. <laughs> I'm like, oh, seriously? <laughs> this has been like almost a year and a half. Where's the... And he says, you know, we can't determine if you're... George Michael or Brian Adams. And I just, I just, you know, like, what can you do? What can you say to that? It's like, wow. oh, you can't determine if I'm two multi platinum artists. Okay. And I'm on tour with Manilo and there's no album. So was that, you know, the artist's bad timing? No, it's out of your control. The next deal with Hollywood, I decided every single thing I'm going to say yes and smile anything they want, any gig, anywhere at all, I'll be there. And it still had the same fate, even though it, it had some success, it still eventually kind of didn't go where it should have gone. Right. So I think timing is kind of out of your control, a candy thing. I mean, you know, if we had been, I guess, a year later, it would have been poison because they were pretty much candy with a little more makeup. Yeah. And, and buddies of ours. I mean, ha have, have you experienced a positive result from timing? <laughs> my my former bandmate and and still good good lifelong friend since I've known growing up in Berkeley Jonathan Daniel who's a real strong industry presence now yeah, um, still. yeah big time uh, he wrote an article once I don't recall where it came out of but it's but it was called Kyle Vincent a man out of time and he spoke about this in that article it's like it's like this is a guy who is just so locked in to 
a certain kind of time period that either someday it'll be so retro it'll be cool or it'll just never be in sync with what's happening. You know, you get to a point in life where you kind of start stop worrying about it and yeah. just kind of do what you do. Well, I mean, but clearly I, I, other people have seen, you know, and, and appreciated it. I mean, you got on a Barry Manilow tour, for example. I mean, certainly people like me and Michael, I mean, there are other people who recognize that. Yeah, it's not like my songs have been completely out of out of sync with what's I mean, Wake Me Up was fully in sync with what was going on in the late 90s. So, sure, sure. so it's not like I'm always out of sync. I guess that that was kind of a uh, misleading, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I do think I think you're right when it comes to time and you can't worry about it because it's one of those things where you can't force timing to be right or wrong. It's just one of yeah. those. It just happens. And it's sure. either an, you do it, what you do. It's you know, either an follow your heart moment or it's a holy crap moment. You know, you're right. And, you know, I I have a real, I think, a kind of a good example of this from a songwriting point of view, because there's kind of many aspects to what I do. And, and sometimes it's writing specifically to try to get covers, you know, because that's pretty much one of the only ways to have uh, success at, at, at this point for um, for songwriters. And um, and so I started writing with uh, a couple of people, and and this is maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and they kept wanting to put in these. Uh, 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 I'm going because what Katy Perry did it and had a hit a year ago, and now like there's 30 songs that do uh, 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 uh. right. By the time we finish writing this song, send it out, get it to somebody, they record it, and then it hits the radio. It's three years down the road. Nobody wants to hear uh, 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 then. So right. it's like, you can't be chasing your tail. You have to be honest with what you do. Yeah, and exactly. if it comes around for you, great. If it doesn't, hey, you, you did your best and your fans still like you. I mean, that's yeah. the best you can hope for. Do you follow streaming at all? I mean, do you look at Spotify, Apple Music, those kinds of things? And, you know, we, we certainly appreciate the difference in the financials between a stream and a download and a Why physical Why isn't candy unit. available on Spotify? <sighs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> You've been asked that before, apparently. <laughs> well, so I think of, you know, I love, I love streaming. I listen to, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Soundhound. Like when I'm in the gym and I hear 90% of the songs, I have no idea what they are. And I've discovered so many great new songs. I'm so, yeah. I wish I had, I'll look it up here maybe if we have a break. I'll tell you this one I just found that I just love. Um, I don't know why we're, we're on it. I, I know that my royalty checks are about point oh 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 one penny for like 10,000 spins. So somebody's got to fix that. So I'm a little, I like streaming. I like just all these different avenues of getting your music out, whether it's, you know, iHeartRadio, YouTube, sure. Spotify, Amazon, all these, it's just incredible. It's never been better opportunity to get the masses to listen to you. Yeah. It's not really coming back to the songwriter and the performer at my level. Yeah, I mean, it goes to the rights holder, and and Michael and I have talked about about that too. Do you do you track? I mean, do you do you look online and see where your streams are coming from, and you know um, what songs are being streamed the most? And do you ever engage with people who add you to playlists or any of that stuff? Are you in, are you engaged with that stuff at all? Um, yes, to the first part. No, to the second, and that's that's a really good idea. No, I haven't really done that. I mean. The other thing, Jay, is that when I'm when you're an independent artist, artist, you, I'm wearing every single hat. Oh, I know, absolutely. You, know, you really, people really have no idea. I mean, yeah. I won't get into the minutia of it, but I truly do everything. We'll talk about it for a second because Michael and I again we we've talked about this. It's not like it used to be, you know. Say when you in 1985 when you were with Candy, it was a whole different world. People did a lot of those things for you. Now you've got to take care of your website, your socials. You've got to take care of your gigs. You've got to take care of getting paid. You've got to take care of any PR, travel, I mean, and then continuing to network. I mean, right. holy cow. I mean, talk about that for a second. What is involved now compared to where you used to be? We could have a four. This could be a four-hour answer. It yeah. really could. Um, I'll give you one little answer first and then do more. But uh, yesterday I flew from... Massachusetts, on the way to the airport, I did a little presentation at a community college, continued to the airport, flew to Philadelphia, you know, delays, 
transfers are fly to LA. Okay, during this whole day yesterday where I could barely even breathe because there was no time, I'm getting texts and calls. We have a gig for you, New York. We need, uh, I need a vi- and this is amazing. I'm so thrilled to have sure. this. We need video. We need your best YouTube. We need a high res 8x10. We need blah, blah, blah. Okay. There's people struggling, you know, welders and people struggling to survive. So I'm not complaining about this. Of I'm course. Just saying, you do. There is nobody who does that. You know, you have to do it. You, you have to do everything. And if you don't do it, well, I mean, nobody's going to knock on your door and say, hey, man, here's your gold record. So um, during the day yesterday, I just had I and I found the time because you have to. And if you want to, you will. But yeah. there are really only so many hours in the day you have to sleep. And guess what? You got to write songs. You have to create. You have to live to get the inspiration for the songs. That takes time. So, I mean, like, for instance, on this, this Manilo album, every single choice, the fact that it's in a cool little plastic resealable bag. Well, I got that idea from Japan because the Japanese fans love that. And mm-hmm. most of my followers are in Japan. So this is a total respect move. Got it. This was really complicated to get really complicated it delayed it like a week and a half just to get this i mean right just minutia like that you know, did you have to research size. that did you have to do the the gr- leg work to go take care of that i imagine absolutely and again it's it's kind of embarrassing to even sit here and whine about this stuff it's like no, oh no, it's no, really it's not whining at all it's reality <laughs> but we're just talking about music so in you know in con- in in consideration yeah. of just music yeah, there's a lot to do. If you think of the whole world, this is, you know, nothing. Well, you know, what, what, what I always take away from conversations like this is it's, it's all about how do you prioritize. So, <laughs> y- you know, in my, in my world, you know, I'm, we're all overwhelmed with stuff. How do you prioritize what gets done first and what gets done at, you know, a week from now? Is it... Is it anything that's directly related to earning you revenue becomes the top priority? Is it an immediate fan conversation? Become How do you prioritize what do you do right away and what can you push off till tomorrow or next week or next month? I'm getting better at that, really doing what – it isn't – it isn't necessarily the financial aspect, but that has to be a factor, certainly, because you have to pay bills. You know, right. everybody has to prioritize everything in their life. What are we paying first, you know? Um, but for me, I definitely put fans first. And so I'm always thinking of that. That's always kind of the big driving factor for me. Um, I am going to be spending a little more time in Nashville for writing and recording because I think that's prudent. Um, but, uh, I think prioritizing is, 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 especially since we just talked about all the things that have to be done, all the little ridiculous things that have to be done, you have to prioritize. You'll go nuts and you'll get nothing done. Yeah. The social media is so time consuming. It's yeah, just people crazy. don't realize. Oh my God. I mean, you can't just, I can't just post. I mean, it's, this sounds silly, but you can't just post. I'm in the studio, but what you have to really think about it because tens of thousands of people are going to read your words. You have to watch, you know, it's not like certain people who just tweet anything in the middle of the night. I mean, you really have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. I don't about. know what you're talking about. <laughs> you, know, you really have to watch. You have to be very careful. With and that. then don't you have to take time to respond and engage, right? Right. Because right. this is your – you've got a base and you've got a rabid base. I, I, I've seen them. And they have a sense of ownership. Maybe that's a poor choice of words. But you – because you engage with them, they feel connected. But that also, that's the good thing. And then they're, you know, they're consumers and they follow you and see you live and buy your, your albums. But you've, it's also a lot of work because you've got to, you know, respond to that. Do you ever have any trouble with, you know, online with trolls or, you know, uh, people, you know, that cause trouble? Do you ever run into any of that online like some folks do? Yeah, I've always thought the wackos or the psychos, as I, I as I call them, are a sign of success. The more you have, the more successful you are. Yep. I only have a little handful. I'm a little, I need to up my. <laughs> we're we're yeah. taking applications for trolls here. <laughs> I used to, uh, you know, I used to worry about things like, oh my god, anybody can find out where you live nowadays. It's like I hope. <coughs> excuse me. 
Sure. I hope they find where I live because if they start, you know, stalking my house, that means I've done something right. Right. And if you're not, you know, if you're not shaking somebody up, you're probably not trying hard <laughs> enough. Kyle, you mentioned that, um, you know, uh, a, a, a big portion of your fan base is Japan. Um, what kind of challenge does that put on you from a social media aspect? Because, you know, if you're a local band in California and your fans are in California, you're not thinking about time zones, different languages, um, different meanings to phrases. I mean, does that add a whole nother level of complication now? You know, it's like, I can't post this at 5 a.m. my local time because they're sound asleep in Japan. Or, you know, they. I have to figure out how to translate this into Japanese. I got to say, you guys are asking questions that are just so spot on it's i'm really i'm yeah i'm impressed you guys should go into the music business <laughs> <laughs> you know your stuff there's no money in it yeah <laughs> exactly you want to um, hire us uh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as jay said there's no money in it <laughs> right, exactly. just uh, i mean you just answered it kind of i mean you answered it absolutely i love traveling i love different countries i speak enough japanese to get around Oh, I can good. Get in the Philippines, pretty well. Um, you have to learn as Americans. I think we're kind of um, <clears throat> either innate or bred or something to kind of think the whole world either is or should be like our country, and it right. is. Right. And right. It's the first thing you discover when you get off the plane in Japan, you better have gifts for everybody. You better bow, and you have to bow the certain way, depending on who it is and how old they are. And you learn that. I find it a challenge, and I love it. I love yeah. learning it so much. And I'm very, very in tune as soon as I land in a different country, what you do here. You don't talk on the subways in England. You know, <laughs> there's like there's yeah. different things in different countries. And you learn uh, about their culture a little bit. I noticed on – it might have been your website uh, – I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was some kind of communication that you have specifically just for Japan, whether it was a social thing or something. You know what I'm talking about? There was something on your website that was just for Japan, for your Japanese fans. Yeah, I, I, I need to update it. Thanks for um, putting me on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to do that. I even have one, building one for the Philippines. It, you know, you guys have way more insight. I, I, I wouldn't mind asking this question to you, actually, which is, I feel fragmented sometimes. I just feel so – it starts to get scattered. And it's like – and I also try not to post too much, and I, and you could probably beat me up for that. But it's just – it feels like overkill, and I, st I start to almost get embarrassed. It's like, fine, you've got a new album. We got it. You know, your, your certain number of people, your core people have liked it. They've engaged. Maybe they've ordered it. Stop bothering us. Yeah. yeah, I don't think those people get bothered, Kyle. I think that, you know, I, I watch your socials and, and what I like what you do is you'll put on, you know, some live clips. Those are super cool. Even if you've seen them before, that's that's kind of cool and kind of a throwback Thursday kind of thing once in a while. And and I think it's just really charming sometimes when you're recording a new album, getting ready to put out an album you know, you, you share kind of that process with, with folks. And like you mentioned with us, you know, the, the sleeve, you know, a little post like that, those are charming inside kind of things that, you know, fans really appreciate. And again, it gives them a sense of ownership and a sense of like, they're the in crowd, you know, they've got the inside track. Yeah. And, and right. And um, I, I mean, kind of like when I said kind of bothering, I mean, kind of the peripheral people that are not necessarily fans and they're like, yeah, I, screw them. Head. I don't know. Screw You're them. right. Screw that's, those that's, fans. Can't, can't worry about them. I mean, you know, this, you, know you, this, you, you brought up a good, you brought up a good point about fragmenting, you know, know. fragmenting your fans. And it, I, I've, I've had this challenge with clients Going going back to like ninety eight when I was working on the Kiss website, you know, Kiss is a band that's international, and we were like, well, do we have different versions of our news for different countries? Is it translated for you know this country? And and right. up to just recently, I had a past client who was like, I want to have a Facebook page for each country that we have major fan bases in. Wow. And it's just like, well, there's pluses and minuses of doing this because remember 
you want one home. You want one Facebook page. That's where everybody should come to get everything. And, and, and you, don't want to where frag- the is. you don't want to fragment it into 12 different pages. Right. And right, who's maintaining them? And how do you keep consistency across them? And is the message the same? And, and, and again, translations and timing of posts. And at the end of the day, you really, I think, do more harm than good by doing that. As opposed to just make, you know, if it's really important that you've got a fan base in Germany, well, then just make a special post on your main Facebook page that's been translated into German and you post it in the appropriate time so it comes up for their breakfast. Do that rather than building a whole separate world for them to go live in because the the, the big downside could be they get so attached to this new world you built for them that they never come back to your main page again. Exactly. Exactly. So so I guess I shouldn't beat myself. I guess my instincts no. were actually okay because yeah. I started to create all these. And I'm like, man, it's too much. And not it's only not like I, you have a lot of free time, Kyle. <laughs> that's the thing. And you won't have enough free time to service them anyway. So then it goes outdated yep. and then you've actually disrespected them. It, it, yeah. Exactly. And, and, and honestly, Facebook has got so many tools now that you can – you know, we can sit here at at 11:30 a.m. on a Thursday morning, and I can schedule a post to go live at 3 a.m. because right. it's going live in Europe. I can geo-target that post to a country, to a city. Right. Um, right. Uh, Facebook even now offers the option: Do you want us to translate your status update for you into a different language? Even if you don't do that, run it through Google Translate, get a rough translation. You throw. They it appreciate up there. the effort. Um, Absolutely. It's I don't perfect. take that chance. I always contact somebody in the country and make sure that <laughs> yeah. they do the right translation. Yeah, but, I mean, but, use but those fans as the, your the, street the, team. The, the They're tool, good like the that. The tools are there to keep it all within your world. Yeah, and, yeah. and and frankly, it's it's good because, um, and, and I get this from my clients all the time, uh, I love Bands in Town. Great app for tracking tour dates. And, you know, whenever you add a new tour date, Bands in town can automatically make a post for you announcing that tour date. And I'll have some clients who are like, oh, my God, we've got to remove this app because my uh, my wall is just filled with every single tour date. That's all I'm reading. And I'm like, well, you see that because you're an admin on the page. You see every single uh-huh. post. But I had the same complaint. Okay. Yeah. But Bands in town, if you've, co- if you've configured it correctly – will only make those posts in the region of the show. Meaning, you announce a show in Dusseldorf, Germany, it's only going to put that on the wall of your fans who are in Germany. Your fans in the U.S. will have never seen that show announcement. And there's no reason they ever need to see that show announcement. So geo-targeting is really good about that. And 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 I think more people need to think in those terms it's not one yeah. post for everybody it's right. who really needs to see this and who doesn't and that's right. a good point with all these tools that we have these days we there's no sense you know there's an old joke in the advertising industry that half of my advertising doesn't work i just don't know which half well that's not an excuse anymore because now you can go and you know surgically strike when you're playing the West Coast, you can advertise just to those people. And you can also go, well, I think these fans of mine, or let's say fans that aren't your fans yet, but they're fans of some other artist, you can target them too. And yeah. it makes it it makes it makes really, you know, like I said, surgical. And you can uh, do it inexpensively. Um, I wanted to ask you, Kyle, um, this, this Manilow songbook, you know, I've heard you play Manilow songs for years. Clearly, you know, you've worked with him. You've got a passion for it. It's, I don't care what anybody says. You know, it may not be cool to like Barry Manilow, but I'll, I'll bet you most people watching this, you know, they've got a few Barry Manilow songs that they absolutely love. Um, tell us how that songbook album kind of came about. Well, two ways. Um, not too long ago when I was touring the Philippines, they needed some kind of hook. And so the promoter there suggested I record a, a Manilow album. I quickly put together something that was just kind of rushed and just something for the fans there. So that kind of put it in my mind. I'm, I, I've been a huge fan, as I said earlier, since I was a teen. In fact, in this house that I'm in right now, <laughs> I would, uh, 
I would I essentially learn to sing to Barry Manilow and uh, and Barry Gibb and probably Barry White and Barry Williams. <laughs> <laughs> nice, and, uh, well played, and, sir. Uh, but the, you know, as hardwood floors mm. in here, the echo is just incredible, and I never planned on being a singer. I still don't know how I got to where I am right now. I'm, well. <laughs> um, I never had this as my life career. I didn't know what I was going to do. But um, but I just, when I heard a friend of mine brought over Barry Manilow Live one day, right at this door here, and I just melted. I was like, oh my God, who is it? What is this? It was so different. And people, I think, forget. He was kind of this cool, almost an FM kind of artist. You know, he had some really neat, like a, the male Laura Nero, almost. Just a real songwriter. And his first couple albums, if you haven't really dug into the um, album cuts, there's some really cool, non-bombastic, non-modulating stuff. So I just fell in love with every track. And it would be hilarious because over the years, I'd show up at his shows and I would wait overnight and get front row one ticket because I could never find anybody to go with me usually. And here I am again with the hair. I'd be in candy. I'd be solo guy, whatever. And here I am in the front row. And all the Fanalo girls are like, who is this guy? What's he doing here? <laughs> you know, I'd just be like, and I'd be just like them. Oh, Barry. You know, just <laughs> completely enamored by this guy. And it was so much more than the music. I mean, I love the voice. I love the songs. But the most important thing I took away was his stage persona, the way he the performance. Kind of a nerdy looking guy in a way. But he was, he didn't really move really comfortably, but that was so charming. And if he was just this, you know, really, you know, perfectly like, handsome yeah. guy who had all these slick moves, I don't think he would have been as famous because he allowed, you know, his whole audience was made of kind of the misfits and, and kind of middle-aged women who are just kind of feel, you know, I need somebody to sing for me. And, you know, those are kind of mostly my fans too now. And they have been for many years, and and they're the best. And so, anyway, I connected with Barry in that way. And then I, um, if we have time, uh, I was playing the Roxy one night, and I had kind of decided I was going to give up. I was in my twenties. Candy was done. I had shopped songs. I'd shopped for deals. Nothing was happening. I'm like, you know what? I got to move on to something else. I go back to school or something. So I I play the true the uh, Roxy, and it's really crowded, and. Um, after sound check, I went to the sound uh, to the ticket office and I called Barry Manilow's manager. I know who he was, and he answered the phone because it was after hours. I said, "Look, I'm I'm kind of like a young Barry Manilow, and I'm playing the Roxy tonight on your way home to Bel Air or wherever you live. Maybe you want to stop by. I'll put your name on the list. Yeah, sure, put my name on the list." He showed up. Wow. Calls me the next day, signs me to a management deal, and we get a record deal with MCA, and I get on tour opening Barry's show. Ballsy move. Timing. All, timing. All, all, there you go. There's your timing. All because I went to the ticket office and decided, you know what? What the hell? I could have just Why said, not? oh, it's ridiculous. He'll never show up. And the what the hells have always led to some kind of success, it seems like. Or rather, the success is always because of that. Oh, what the hell? Let me try this. Yeah, but you made that phone call. And sometimes you just have to make a move. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So that's how it happened, and 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 then we went to uh, he took me to the uh, we went to the uh, Desert Inn in Vegas, and he sat there in the audience and just kind of went over my opening act, you know, and say, you know, Kyle, you're walking on stage like this. You need to walk on like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ky yeah. Kyle, you you've kind of got a distinction of you've had had record deals with what basically every major label. Pretty much. <laughs> um, what What's your takeaway after going through and having deals with all of the major labels? What's one or two lessons that you've taken away from all of that? Um, being a nice guy goes a long way. And you'd be surprised. Every little thing is really kind of watched. You're... The way you react to pretty much everything is watched and um, and kind of logged. Me meaning so, things like if you're sitting in a conference room meeting, they're paying attention to how you're reacting, what you say, everything. 
Well, I just, I just, I mean, it's not difficult. I'm a pretty nice guy, but I mean, you, you know, the prima donna stuff doesn't really work unless you're just so huge. You can, you know, you make it in spite of your, you can attitude. afford to piss people off. <laughs> yeah. But even those people pay the price eventually, I believe. I think the reason I'm still going is because I have, I've pissed off less people <laughs> than I've probably made happy. And, and I think you need to uh, just kind of be a nice guy. That's, that's by far probably the biggest lesson. Um, yeah. You know, I don't really know what else to say, except know your stuff, research, don't go in there just blindly. Like, you know, I mean, know that you have to make those phone calls. No, no, learn how to promote yourself. You know, what, what, you know, obviously you've had many, record label contracts what have you learned about the contracts that have been presented to you over the years kim fowley once told me i used to be kim fowley's um personal assistant for a total probably three years wow there, there there's a book right there boy that's that's a whole nother story sadly we'd all be you know <laughs> too many people would be arrested if i wrote that book <laughs> um but the one kim kim said something really funny he said kyle never Never question the ten percent they take off the top. That's for the mafia. So, <laughs> that's what they got because I, I don't know if you know about the record deals, but there's always this. They pay you on ninety percent. Like it just starts at ninety. Right. Ten percent is gone, and it depends on what they'll say. Oh, it's for overages. It's for you know breakage. Break. Whatever. 10%. They got to get a new factory. That's a pretty high rate. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, he taught me that. Uh, what I learned is. Um, Record labels are, uh, I'll, I'll be a, an outlier here. I think record labels and record companies are actually great things for artists because, you know, it takes away so much of the pressure of all the stuff you have to do. And, um, and I would welcome one again, even today in this crazy world, because it's, uh, you know, where it really helps is when you're on the road for promotion and things like that. Sure. You can get into stores and on radio and on festivals and things like that, that you really, it's such a pain to do on your own. And, right. uh, and I think even crappy record deals are still record deals. I mean, you know, you either get the A, B or C deal. That's what my old attorney used to tell me. <laughs> We're going to try to get you the A. We'll probably get you the B. And Candy had a C deal. but Is, yeah. is, there, such, yeah, is, there, is there such thing as a perfect record deal a perfect record contract is that achievable for uh like a first-time artist uh, or sure. for, uh, uh, you know i be, be, based on your experience i mean do you go in going all right i i know we're never going to get the ideal contract we just gotta get as best as we can i mean what what's your feelings you're taxing my memory a little because I got to tell you, Michael, honestly, I haven't thought of record deals in 15 years. I just don't even think about them. They're not even even on my radar. It's a, I don't even send my stuff out to record labels. Never. There's no reason to. It's, you know, it's just it, that isn't like being, you know, depressed or, you know, giving up. It's just reality. It's 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 just, you know, now actually silly thinking, but I actually think the Manila one probably has might have a home somewhere. Because it's awesome. kind of moving pretty briskly, um, yeah. but uh, so the ideal record deal, sure, one that that gives you good points and that, gives you that, nice that has no ten percent off the top for the mafia. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> the mafia five percent. I mean, there you go. I don't eat ten at this point. They're doing pretty well. Yeah, um, I, I I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. I mean, I've been happy every time I've had a deal. It's 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 an amazing feeling to know people are you know putting their butts on the line because they think your music is good have you reached out to barry or his manager about the the new album um as the process was going on i did um for one reason or another uh and there's interest but that, that's a that's a conversation in progress sure <laughs> no i i would think that they would be pretty uh uh you know, excited, and uh, it's, it's such a huge compliment that somebody loves your music enough to go to all the trouble to, you know, do their own interpretation of it. I think it's a huge compliment, and I think they would take it that way. I hope so. I mean, you know, look, I probably overthink, but I think that's also part of being an artist. Um, I definitely hesitated because his fans, arguably, are the most dedicated fans. Maybe Kiss and Manilow fans honestly, are probably the most dedicated fans in the history of, of music, I, I would 
venture to guess. They're right up there. Sure. And um, and so I knew, even though a lot of the Manilow fans know me, because anybody ever associated with him, you know, kind of gets a little thumbs up. But to do his songs could be kind of scary because it's like, how dare you do the master's tunes? Are you crazy? Are you, or are you, or are you trying to you know, cash in on his success and your small connection or something like that? So all those things had to go through my head. And at the end of the day, and also the fact that I just love the songs and the productions, like how can I possibly, you know, m make them my own? Okay, so I just kind of messed around in the studio one day. And the stuff that came out of me when I was singing them, it's like all of a sudden I'm a teenager singing to Manilow in, in my mother's house and all the emotions involved at that time of life. And it started to come across on tape. Like, you know what? Let me try another one. And all of a sudden I listened to this. And I mean, it's very pure and honest. And there's there's a full, full story that comes with it. It is so um, uh, complimentary. Of, of Barry and his impact. Yeah, you know? I read that story. It was it was very okay. touching. Yeah, I mean it's and it's very honest and I, and I think um, I, I'd be shocked if they weren't happy with that. Whether or not they like the recordings, in my rendition. Yeah, but, you know the story and just the effort itself. I hope, I hope he and him and his fans uh, can appreciate that at least. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, Kyle. This this was awesome. I mean, there's just. Great conversation. Great conversation. So many stories. So much we could delve into in a you know hour long conversation here. It's just you know it's 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 refreshing to talk to somebody who's got this much experience in the music industry and isn't jaded. Is still excited and fun and happy about it. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's kind of weird. My my friend Nigel Dick, who's a really kind of sure. Cool famous video director video producer yeah yeah he did like uh you know do they know it's christmas and all that yeah uh he wants to he called me a few months ago i think it was after your show or maybe before your show jay and he said uh he said kyle i want to do a documentary on you know we've never it's never gone much further than that because of finances and other things and logistics of our schedules I said, wow. why would you want to do a documentary on me, Nigel? And he said, because you're still doing this. Why? Why are you? St how? How do you show up in people's homes? And and so yeah. there is a certain kind of, um, I guess I've I've kind of turned into a. I kind of appreciate the survival part of it now. You know, just that I do still find joy in it. Yeah, and the shows are still good. The music's still good. Um, I, I encourage anybody watching, you know, go go catch Kyle live. Um, I can't wait. I'll be seeing you in February. Looking forward well, to that. Where, where's your website? Where can people get info on tours, get your album? Uh, just kylevincent.com, uh, Facebook, find me, Instagram, Twitter. Nobody Is anybody doing Twitter? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, My yeah, not really. <laughs> It depends on the artist. Seems some like people are very good. active, some aren't. Yeah, yeah. All Your right. fans will know. I guess. But I really appreciate you guys having me today. What a what a blast. We could talk forever. Great talking with you. And I, I hope you know, you'll come on again sometime and we can pick yeah. it up where we left it off. You can teach me tagging and how best to get people involved. <laughs> Count really, on it. You, yeah, you got it. It's a deal. All right, man. Time for that. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. All right, Kyle. Take, Take care, care, man. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Uh, loved chatting with Kyle, uh, you know, and, and from the heart, a fan. I mean, going back yeah. to Candy. And, 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 you know, Candy was one of those bands where actually I, 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 it was a splinter of starting to follow everybody who was in Candy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, John, Jonathan, and, Jonathan sure. had a great album with The Loveless. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan Roxy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was just one of those bands that gave birth to an immense amount of talent. And it was a catchy record. I mean, for its time, it was just a really fun. I mean, that's the name of the album. Whatever happened to fun? Right, exactly. Uh, it, it was just a, a really fun record. And Kyle was such a great guest. You know, as you mentioned before, he's got such experience, and he's still doing it. But I can tell you, when you go see him live, it's one of those shows. Yeah, it's kind of a guilty pleasure, you know. Although, like he said, I don't feel guilty about it. But what's really cool about it is you just leave feeling good. 
you know it's a lot of fun it's you know a little kitschy in parts you know when they when he starts playing some of those 70s uh songs that you you know had forgotten about some of the one hit wonder stuff um but he is quite the performer so it, it was a lot of fun having him on yeah yeah definitely definitely check out the manilow album we got a we he gave us a little sneak peek before he came on and sounds fabulous yeah and the story um, that he was talking about he he writes these liner notes and it's really kind of a just a story about his life and what brought him to that point and it's it's really touching and that's worth the price of admission right there so yep. pick that up so uh before we wrap up let's do another episode of uh you need help with your online strategy we kicked this off last week yeah little tidbits and uh, Jay and I kind of were combining our lists of topics here, and this one is a combination of two of them that we each had. So why don't you read right. this week's little You Need Help With Your Online Strategy? You got it. Okay. If you have a new album coming out and your YouTube channel and other images online are still branded to promote your last album, you need help with your online strategy. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, and 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 I want to why why is YouTube called out? Well, for me, that's because that seems to me to be the channel, the social network channel that everybody forgets about. Yeah. Nobody goes yeah. back and it's like, "Oh, wait a second, what's my cover image look like on my YouTube channel? What's my profile yeah. image look like? What is the featured video I've got on my YouTube channel?" Oh, it's all from 5 years ago. Nobody right. thinks of it. We we a lot of people think about changing your header image on Facebook, but then Facebook, you don't. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. But yeah, the whole point here is you got to change it across the board. It's got everywhere. It's got to be that new release or new project. The other thing I would add to this is it's so easy now whether you distribute your own music or whether you go through a label or indie, whatever it is. Look at you know, uh, the, the streaming services and Amazon, especially like look at Spotify. There's two images on, on Spotify that, that can be affected. Make sure those reflect as well. And there are companies like Rovi. Um, there, there are all sorts of companies that can kind of help you to, you know, band page that can help you um, syndicate. That's the word I'm looking for. These images to all of the different services so they're all covered at once but they you want those to be consistent across the board yeah i i've encountered way too many clients who think oh that's just that's meaningful meaningful labor you know yeah we'll do we'll change those images it's no big deal no it is a big deal it's something it is I, a big deal. I always put it in 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 a marketing plan as like almost one of step one is we're going to do across the board branding checkup for you we're going to look at everything we're going to make sure everything is consistent because yeah changing and uploading right uh, uploading the photo is very easy it takes 10 seconds to do but the problem is i can guarantee you almost 100 percent of the artists out there forget something somewhere yeah yeah and it does reflect on on how professional you are and how current you are and it's a very small thing, but it's an important thing. It's small, important, but very easy to do. And, and again, like all these tidbits, they impact everybody from the, the singer-songwriter, the entertainer like Kyle we just had, all the mm -hmm. way up to your major international acts. Don't, and, and more importantly, don't assume your record label is going to do this for you. Don't assume anything. You yeah. need to at least go look. If it hasn't been changed, you can call your record label and say, go change it. But just yeah. don't assume it's going to happen because, trust That's right. me, it doesn't happen most of the time. Yeah, and plan it out so, you know, well in advance, know what image that you want to use and know that there are you know, there's profile images as well as kind of longer header images. And make sure that you have the right image that's going to look good in both. It's going to look good on mobile. It's going to look good on a laptop. You know, um, just kind of plan that out a little bit. That imaging, it matters. It does. Very important. So there you go. You need help with your online strategy. There you go. That's episode two of that one. <laughs> We're up to episode 260-something of Music Biz Weekly. Um, awesome. 
love feedback from you guys. What do you think of the show? What do you think of Kyle? Um, timing. Just give us some comments. It's always good to hear back from you. And, you know, what do you think Absolutely. of our little tid tidbits here of you need help with your online strategy? Let us know. Hit us up online. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. You can find us. And uh, until next week, we're out of here.